The Braves are still making moves, but they remain on the hunt for help in the starting rotation. Welcome in to another edition of BPTV. I'm Grant McCauley. He is Chris Willis, and we've got plenty of Braves talk to get into. But before we get started, as always, we would love your help with growing the channel. Go ahead, hit that like button, leave a comment on this video, and share the show with a friend. We'd appreciate that. And make sure you hit that subscribe button and enable those alerts so you won't miss a thing that we have coming for you right here on the Battery Power YouTube channel. Uh, Chris, it seems like every week that goes by, Alex Anthopoulos swings another trade or two, and this week was no exception whatsoever. No, you're right. They've been busy, uh, especially, and it, everything stems from that uh, trade with Seattle that brought Jerry Kelnick too. It's uh, they've been they've been very um, busy, uh, you know, kind of spending that money off. So uh, it's been kind of fascinating to watch, honestly, how they've have they shuffled everything around. Yeah, we're going to talk about those dominoes. We're actually going to hear from Jared Kelnick on this edition of the show as well, as we finally got to uh, talk a little bit with him about his trade to Atlanta, his injury last year, the hot start that had everybody thinking that maybe the breakout season was 2023. I think the Braves are hoping that breakout season will be 2024. We'll get into that in a few minutes, but let's lead off with that Braves trade news because there were a couple more of those. Atlanta unloading first baseman Evan White, along with a Rule 5 pick in Tyler Thomas, sending those two men to the Angels in exchange for infielder David Fletcher and veteran catcher Max Stassi. That just continues to shuffling the pieces you just mentioned and the money that was involved with the acquisition of Jared Kelnick. I think they've whittled that from $29.5 million with the initial trade from with Seattle to around $17 million, if my math is correct, and it may be. I think I'm at least in the ballpark on that in order to acquire Jared Kelnick. Stassi then spawned to the Chicago White Sox and Fletcher actually passed through waivers and outrighted off the 40 man roster, which at first I kind of wondered what was going on there, but it sounds like that was nothing but a procedural move. So, Chris, I say all that and set all that up to ask you uh, all these trades this winter. They have been that series of dominoes that we've discussed. But uh, what do you make of the most recent series of events? The acquisition of Fletcher in particular seems like somebody who could be helpful for the Braves uh, come spring training and, and come opening day if he's able to make that roster and maybe bounce back after a couple of down years in uh, Anaheim. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, you know, is obviously moving the money around and, uh, you know, being able to stay, uh, keep some form of flexibility, uh, probably giving them the uh, possibility of adding a starter uh, later later this offseason. You know, I don't think you can close the book on David Fletcher yet. You know, to me, he looks like a, a good um, – a good possibility at for a bench piece, you know, particularly in the middle middle infield where they don't, uh, you know, they don't have the whole lot of uh, bench depth at this mo at this point. Just looking at the forty man roster, so was a little bit surprised to see him outright it off, uh, but you know, it, it'd be really easy to bring him back as well. Yeah, the forty man roster has oddly turned into about a thirty to thirty five man roster over the course of this winter. I can't say I've seen that too many times before. Uh, just looking at Fletcher, he hit two forty seven last year. Uh, with the Los Angeles Angels, only 33 games in the big leagues, less than 100 plate appearances. But overall, six years, uh, nearly 2,200 plate appearances. He's a 277 hitter, uh, OPSing just under 700. A useful infielder, I think. Good glove, can play some multiple positions. Sounds a lot like Nicky Lopez, but he is owed, I believe, about $15 million over the course of the next couple of years. And I believe there's a third-year buyout of at least one of the option years that were in that contract that the Angels wanted to get rid of. The Braves didn't hold on to Max Stassi very long. They did not need another veteran catcher and spun him off to the Chicago White Sox. But Fletcher, I think you bring up an interesting point with Nicky Lopez going to the White Sox, no less, in the trade that got all of this started. That's brought over Aaron Bummer. And with Vaughn Grissom seemingly still a man without a position and not a guy that I think the Braves want to relegate to being the utility infielder, it does seem like Fletcher could be a useful player for the Braves. But we can't really bury the lead on all of these trades that Atlanta and Alex Anthopoulos have been making they were really designed to get Jared Kelnick over and into Atlanta's outfield mix. And we heard from the Braves outfielder for the first time this week. I thought that he sounds like he's excited to, A, get a chance for that change of scenery that a lot of players look forward to. Uh, secondarily, and maybe primarily for him, he's excited it's a team like the Atlanta Braves. So I want to hear a little bit from Kelnick here, his reaction to finding out that he had been traded to the Atlanta Braves after three years with the Seattle Mariners. I had gotten a phone call and from our GM with the Mariners and he uh, just informed me that I was going to be going to Atlanta. And once I heard that, like I was fired up because I knew I was going to go to a really good organization that, um, you know, they've had a winning history the last however many years. Um, and it's no question that like they were 
like one of the best teams in baseball all last year and years prior. And I was really looking forward to just being a part of that and learning from those guys and kind of just, you know, having a fresh new start and with a new organization. And that's, I'm fired up. Well, Chris, pretty good organization to get traded to. Not that Seattle Mariners were one that hasn't had success recently, but when you look at teams that have done the most winning in Major League Baseball over the course of Jared Kelnick's short career, I would say the Atlanta Braves are at or near the top of that list with back-to-back 100-win seasons with this great young core. It just sounds like there's a whole lot of things he's excited about stepping into. Yeah, it uh, you know my biggest takeaway from that was just you know how genuine he he sounded excited to be coming to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, you know he, he repeatedly talked about how the uh, organization was portrayed and their track record with uh, you know developing players. And I think you know he's uh, you know I think I, I think I really liked that he's coming in with an open mind. He's not coming in saying I've got all the answers. You know yeah. he's looking to learn and looking to learn from this you know this lineup that's been uh, really successful over the last few years. So um, you know I think they think they can unlock something with him, and I think he's hoping the same thing. I do I agree with that, and Brian Snitker also echoed that at the winter meetings, being excited about getting him into a new and a different environment for hitting that the Braves have created over the past few years. I mean, you see that the steps forward that some players have taken, I mean, like it all begins with talent, and I don't think there's any question that Jared Kelnick has a whole bunch of talent. He's flashed it in the past, but how can he turn that into consistent results? Well, he talked a little bit about that. The hot start that he got off to a year ago had a lot of people thinking that maybe he had finally truly arrived from mega prospect to star outfielder for the Seattle Mariners. Kelnick start, talked about what led to that success. And then, of course, we'll get into some of the lows that also came in 2023 for the talented 24-year-old. Everything was just kind of synced up really well. Um, you know, I'm someone that has, uh, you know, last year I had a lot of, I think, moving parts, I would say. And I had a, a bigger, I have a bigger leg kick now, actually, but I had a hand pump thing that was kind of working for me. Um And I just think that I was being really consistent with my movements. My body was feeling really good. I was fresh from, you know, the off season. It was early. And then, um, so I think that was, everything was synced up and I was just seeing the ball really well. Um, And so, you know, going into this off season, that's something that I want to focus on is making sure that, you know, I'm short, a little bit more short and compact. So I can, I'm able to be a little bit more consistent so that I can, you know, hopefully have, you know, those first two months of the season, the entire year. Well, those first two months, he was batting well over 300. He was flashing the power. He looked like the five-tool player that I believe that he can be, Chris. But at the end of the year, you're probably not talking about a breakout season that involves hitting 253 with 11 homers and 13 stolen bases. But, you know, when you have gone through, I think, as many challenges as he did to really start to, to kind of acclimate to major league pitching, I would say that at 23 years old, which is, you know, by, by the way, when a lot of players are busy debuting, he's already in, in parts of his third full season in the big leagues, or at least his third year overall in the big leagues, with parts of those being spent kind of bouncing back and forth between AAA and the majors. I do think it's a step forward, but I think that you, and I'm sure you may feel the same way, the ceiling for Jared Kelnick is a lot higher than a 250 hitter with a handful of home runs and stolen bases. Oh, no doubt. And I mean, I think you said it, he, he showed it during the, you know, the first six weeks of the season last year, you know, the potential was there. And I mean, you know, baseball is a game of adjustments. We all know that, you know, you're going to hit lulls in the, and you're going to have struggles and it's how you handle them. And I thought that was something, you know, that he really talked about that he hasn't always done well. Uh, obviously I know we're going to talk about it, some of that in a minute, but um, you know, and I think that's something the Braves can really help them with because you've seen you've seen players go through the up and ups and downs. And, and Brian Snicker talks about it. He's like, you know, you can prepare them all you want, but until they actually go through it, um, you know, it's it, it, they're not they're not going to be equipped to uh, handle it until they've actually went through it. Yeah, I mean, you actually have to go out there and play the games and have that experience. And you know, I think there's that old quote. I don't know if it's George Patton or whoever. Uh, else it may be. It might even been Christy Matthewson. I'll, I'll have to look this up. Maybe somebody can Google it, leave it in the comments for us as well. Like you can learn nothing from victory or very little from victory. You can learn everything from defeat. And I think that it was a big learning experience last year for Jared Kelnick in that he'd already gone through, I feel like, what he, I'm sure, was um, regarding as enough struggles and wanting to really show the Mariners fans and the world of baseball, maybe even show himself 
what kind of player that he can be at the big league level. That started to manifest itself early, but it did give way to some more struggles. That gave way to some frustration. And after kicking a water cooler, he broke his foot. And that, Chris, I think might be the biggest lesson that Jared Kelnick has learned in his very young career, because as you talked about, it sounds like his perspective has shifted. Let's hear Jared Kelnick's thoughts on what that injury meant to him and maybe the new look that he got, the new lease on life at just 24 years old. I guess it made me take a step back and realize how lucky and how thankful I am to be in the position that I am. Um, and I get to go out I've, ever since I was a young kid, I wanted to play in the big leagues and here I am. And so when I'm in the big leagues and I'm, you know, breaking my foot because out of frustration, like that just can't happen. And, um, and so it made me appreciate the game a little bit more. And when I, when I finally got back, um, like even when I was on my rehab assignment and I was just like back on a baseball field, like I hadn't felt that joy just to be back out on the field because I just truly felt, you know, thankful to have the opportunity to be out there and playing again. Let me hit you with another quote. It's Jack Elliott from the movie, Mr. Baseball. Baseball is a game and games are supposed to be fun. I'm thinking for Jared Kelnick, the game wasn't a whole lot of fun at that time, but being able to shift his perspective to use that phrase again, I think that could pay big dividends for Jared as he moves forward, just having gone through the adversity, even if it was something that was self-imposed. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's a kid that sounds like to me, he's growing up and he's maturing and, uh, you know, and I think that's that reflects well on him, and and I think it bodes well for his future. You know, especially here in Atlanta. So, um, you know, I mean, it, everybody goes through it, and uh, you know, that's another thing that Brian Snicker talks about. He said, it "Doesn't matter who you are, how talented you are, you know, everybody goes through the ups and downs, and and this game can be unforgiven on a lot of cases. And you know, you look at Kellenick, you know, he come in with all the big pedigree as a mm -hmm. top prospect." You know, his first cup of first go round in the majors didn't go well. You get sent back to Triple A. You get you get back up there the next season, and you know you don't want to go back to Triple A. So there's a lot of pressure right there. And I think the biggest thing for him, you know, with this Braves lineup, he doesn't have to come in and be the savior. You know, he can go out there, he can relax. He's going to see probably see uh, consistent playing time. I mean, that's what we're what, what we're anticipating. Yeah. And, you know, he can just he can just relax and have fun. And, you know, I mean, it's it sounds, you know, it, it, it's not it's not rocket science, I don't think. But, it, you know, just to, when a player gets to that point where they can just relax and let their natural talent take um, take over, I think that's when they make the biggest steps forward. Yeah. And I think that the environment, again, is going to be it can play a big part in what Jared Kelnick is looking to do, what he's looking to unlock, you know, working with. And the Braves hitting coach is led by Kevin Seitzer, who was just uh, awarded what Baseball America Coach of the Year this year. I think that's a pretty nice award for Kevin Seitzer, and it, it, it is reflective of how much hard work goes into this. But he talked about being able to maybe pick the brain of a Chipper Jones or you know whoever it is, his teammates as well. He's got some pretty good ones, and he gets to just kind of come in and blend in. And like you said, there's not a pressure on Jared Kelnick to be the next big thing the way that he was supposed to be in Seattle. Maybe he never reached that, uh, you know, made good on all that promise there, but he still has an awful lot of talent. And at 24 years old, time to really let that talent play in a place like the Atlanta Braves and an outfield with Ron Lacuna Jr. With, and Michael Harris and a lineup that has Austin Riley medals and Ozzy Albies and so many others in it. This sounds like a pretty good spot for Jared Kelnick to set up. And the Braves have control over this young outfielder for the next five seasons. So there's an awful lot to like about the Kelnick trade in terms of what it could mean for the Braves, but it's going to be up to Kelnick to go out there and make good on all that potential, turn that talent into results. Uh, meanwhile, the Braves coaching staff has three new members. This has been a very different winter, and it's going to be a very different-looking coaching staff next year and beyond, with Ron Washington leaving along with Eric Young Sr. They're headed out to Anaheim as Wash has taken over as the manager there for the Angels. Drew French, now the pitching coach, for the Baltimore Orioles, all of those guys moving on this offseason. So Atlanta had to find a few good men to complete Brian Snitker's uh, pitching, uh, co excuse me, coaching staff. And at first, we'll start with a familiar name, and Matt Tuiasa Sopo, who's been the manager at AAA Gwinnett since 2021. He began his coaching career in the Braves organization back in 2019. Uh, still a young man by all accounts, but you know he's gotten into the coaching game pretty early, makes it to the major leagues again. He'll take over as third base coach. Current bench coach um, Walt Weiss is going to help fill the gap that is left by Rod Washington and help work with some of the infielders. Then you've got a longtime big league coach in Tom Goodwin as Atlanta's new first base coach, and Eric Abreu comes over from the Houston Astros 
to become the Braves' new bullpen coach. Uh, safe to say things are going to look a little bit different next season, but one of the big strengths of this coaching staff is helping build and maintain that work ethic that goes with a winning culture like Atlanta's. But that's certainly going to be something that the Braves were, were looking for throughout the process of interviewing these guys, and they feel like they've found the three men that are the right fit for this Braves coaching staff that plays a huge role in helping the continuity and consistency of this team day to day. Yeah, I wasn't real surprised that Tuiasa Sopo ended up uh, getting that spot. Uh, you know, Brian Snicker said at the winter meetings, I think that they were doing their due diligence and taking their time looking looking for things. But you know, we seen we've seen him uh, at Rome. We saw him at Gwinnett the last three years. It seems like that they're. They, you know, they've really, he's really carved out his own spot in the organization. Uh, you know, he was called up uh, to service last, uh, last summer when Ron Washington went to be inducted in the Hall of Fame in Louisiana. So, you know, I wasn't too surprised there. Heard nothing but good things about Tom Goodwin. I didn't realize till we were, I was researching uh, once the announcement was made, but, you know, he actually had uh, stints as a first base coach with the Mets and the Red Sox, both, I believe. And then, you know, I've heard nothing but good things about him. Uh, you know, since he's been in the Braves organization. So, you know, I think it's really hard to kind of grade a coaching hires. Uh, you just kind of have to trust them. But, you know, uh, with the, we know how important that continuity has been over the last few years. So I'm sure these, uh, you know, this uh, these additions weren't uh, just, you know, penciled in. I, I'm sure they did their due diligence in hiring them. No doubt. I mean, it, the one thing that is, uh, I think, a constant in the world of baseball and maybe even in life, has changed, and those changes came with opportunities for Ron Washington to get back in that manager's seat, something he very much wanted. Eric Young Sr. moving on with him. Uh, Drew French, I mean, got a chance to hear Brian Snitker's thoughts about him because a lot of Braves fans might have said, well, I'm not exactly sure who that is, and maybe it wasn't top of mind, but uh, Drew French has got just a really great mind for pitching, was a huge part of the Braves' game planning and everything that they were doing day-to-day. And Snit said, look, I knew as soon as he went out on interviews, if they let him sit in front of whatever team it was, the Orioles being that team, he was going to sell himself. And as, as a matter of fact, he ended up getting that job. So congrats to all those men. And we'll see the new Braves coaches uh, don those Braves uniforms and spring training, which is going to be coming up in just a couple of months. So uh, as I said at the top of the show, a lot of things left to do this winter for a lot of Major League Baseball teams. It has been a big and newsworthy week with Shohei Otani signing with the Los Angeles Dodgers. We don't have enough time to get into all of that, but I'm sure that we're going to get into a lot of other things regarding the hot stove and how it affects the Atlanta Braves. That will, of course, wrap us up, though. For this edition of BPTV, thanks, as always, for riding along with us. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. We will catch you next time, and until then, so long, Braves country.